Session 30, Bearing Witness, Living as Catholics. A hymn for all the saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, look upon us with love. You redeemed us and made us your children in Christ. Give us true freedom and bring us to the inheritance you promised through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lamp stand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So our subject matter, bearing witness, living as a Catholic, what the Church teaches. As Christians, by the example of our lives, and the witness of our words, sorry, 
and the, wit uh, the witness of our word have the obligations to manifest the new man we put on in baptism and to reveal the power of the Holy Spirit who strengthened us at our confirmation. We must not only keep the faith and live accordingly, but we must profess it, spread it, and confidently bear witness to it, never being ashamed of it. If the message of salvation is to demonstrate its truth and radiance, it must be authenticated by the witness of our lives. We must seek to order temporal things according to God and shape the world with the power of the gospel. In particular, our chastity, whether we are consecrated or lay, married or single, witness to God's fidelity and loving kindness. That witness, performed in a supernatural spirit, has great power to draw men to the faith and to God. In the sacrament of matrimony, married Christians give witness to the fidelity of Christ to his church. It can seem difficult, even impossible, to bind oneself for life to another human being. However, that makes it all the more important for married couples to proclaim that God loves us with an irrevocable love and that they share in this love. Spouses who witness to God's faithful love by their own fidelity, often in very difficult conditions, deserve the gratitude and support of the Church and the world. The lives of those consecrated to God may seem as special uh, uh, are seen as special signs of the mystery of redemption. In following Christ closely and clearly manifesting his self-emptying, consecrated persons make themselves deeply present to their contemporaries. They bear striking witness that the world cannot be transformed without the spirit uh, of the Beatitudes. There are not over a hundred people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church. There are millions, however, who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church. They draw this belief from hearsay and the media. To counteract their ignorance, we must not only keep the faith and live in it, but also profess it, confidently bear witness to it and spread it. Keeping the faith means knowing the truths of our faith, like those in the creeds, in an adult way, not just childish. Professing it means affirming our belief in it and our allegiance to it without equivocation, that is clearly without ambiguity or double talk. Bearing witness to it means living and acting according to our belief. All this takes courage for as Christ said, the world hates us because of him. Bearing witness is also called testifying or giving testimony. Jesus told Pontius Pilate that he had come into the world to testify to the truth. Paul told Timothy never to be ashamed of his testimony to our Lord. If anyone in this faithless and corrupt age is ashamed of me and my doctrine, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes with the holy angels in his Father's glory, Jesus said. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. And those whom Jesus disowns are damned. I never knew you, he will say. Out of my sight, you evildoers. 
We should be proud to bear witness to Christ, for it makes an extraordinarily valuable contribution to society. It helps to ward off the most dangerous crisis that can afflict the world, namely a confusion between good and evil. If we live what we believe, we are public benefactors. Christ called us the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and he told us to let our light shine before men so that they may see goodness in us and give praise to God. If we are questioned about our faith, then, we can answer with proud confidence, yes, we believe in God, for atheism is not a reasonable alternative, as we tried to show in our talk on um, the problems of atheism. Yes, we are convinced Catholics, for only the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth that God has revealed to humans. The ultimate witness to Christ is martyrdom. In fact, the word martyr is a transliteration, letter by letter, of a Greek word that means witness. It was originally applied to the apostles because they had been eyewitnesses of Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension. For example, when Peter proposed electing someone to take Judas's place, he specified one of those who was of our company while the Lord Jesus moved among us, who will be witnesses with us to his resurrection. For Jesus had given his apostles a mandate. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes down on you. Then you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, yes, even to the ends of the earth. However, as opposition to Christianity spread, the word martyr came to include people who had been persecuted for their belief. And finally, it came to be reserved for those who had suffered death, which included all the apostles except John. From the beginning, martyrs were specially honored, and martyrdom was considered to be a baptism of blood, equivalent to normal baptism. Many Christians have welcomed martyrdom. On his way to Rome in 107 to be thrown to the lions, Ignatius of Antioch wrote to the Romans, My birth is approaching. Do not hold me back from living. Polycarp, who died about 155, praised God for judging him worthy to be counted among his martyrs. Teresa of Avila said that as children, she and her brother settled to go together to the country of the Moors in North Africa, that they might there be beheaded. St. John de Brébeuf, a missionary to the indigenous people of North America who was martyred in Canada, March 16, 1649, by the Iroquois, made a vow to God that he would not try to avoid martyrdom and wrote in his diary, Two days in succession, I have felt in me a great desire for martyrdom and for enduring all the torments the martyrs have suffered. If you want to know more about this very admirable saint, we put some um, information there in footnote 26. <coughs> yeah, very, very shocking, actually to read in detail the torments they endured. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. But very salutary for us. Since about 200 AD, the church has celebrated the memory of a martyr as far as possible on the anniversary of the day he died, which the church regards as his heavenly birthday. Just a couple of days ago, we had a meeting at the parish and a group wanted to use the parish hall for something, a completely secular group. And the discussion came up as to, can, can we let them use it? How would we be, you know, this is a way of giving, wet, bearing witness. And, this, and the discussion went around to the effect that we won't be really having much uh, contact with them. I said, even if I just walk through wearing my collar, <laughs> it's a chance, or say good morning to them, or, yeah. you know. 
Yeah. It's just an opportunity to, to bear witness. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm filling up the car with gas, if people see my collar, and I wear it always wherever yeah. I go. Yeah, they give you a store. second look, I've seen yeah. them. Yeah. But let's go back to martyrdom. We'll talk about these other forms of witness, because we're not all called to martyrdom later in the talk. Martyrdom is not just ancient history, as Charles Lange found. Now, we've got some accounts of a few martyrs in here. We're very careful to choose martyrs about whom we know something. Um, in a historical way, in a, in, a, in a historically reliable way. So you might like to read footnote 27 to see how we know what we do know about St. Charles Luanga and his companions. In 1879, King Teza of Uganda allowed the missionaries of Africa, called the White Fathers, into the country. In less than a decade, they built up a community of about 200 Christians, many of whom lived at court. In 1885, Mutesa was succeeded by Mwanga, a violent man and a pedophile. The Christians, led by the king's chief steward, a 25-year-old Catholic named Joseph Mukaza, were kept busy trying to protect the king's pages and attendants. When the king killed a Protestant missionary and his companions, Joseph confronted him. The king had always liked Joseph, but now he struck at him with a spear and ordered him killed. When the executioners tried to tie Joseph's hands, he said, a Christian who gives his life for God is not afraid to die. He was beheaded and then burned on November 15, 1885. But first he forgave Mwanga and made a final plea for his repentance. After Joseph's death, Charles Lunga became leader of the Christians at court. The following May, when Mwanga asked his page Mwafu where he had been, Mwafu explained that he had been receiving religious instruction from Dennis Sebugwawo. Mwanga sent for Dennis and killed him by thrusting a spear through his throat. Then he had the royal compound sealed and summoned his executioners. Knowing what was coming, Charles baptized four catechumens that night, people already studying to become Christians, including a 13-year-old named Kizito. The next morning, Wanga summoned his court and separated the Christians from the rest by saying, those who do not pray stand by me, those who do pray stand over there. Fifteen boys and young men all under 25, declared that they were Christians. Besides Kizito, the 13-year-old, they included Mbaga, who was the son of the king's chief executioner, who was offered a chance to escape, but declined. It included Andrew Kagwa, a Kigawa chief, who had converted his wife and several others, and Matthias Murumba, also called, known as Kalemba, an assistant judge. Mwanga ordered that they be taken on a 60-kilometer trek to Namugongo and executed there. On their way, they passed the home of the White Fathers. One of the priests gave them absolution as they marched by. Kizito was laughing and chattering, the priest said later, and James Buzabaliawo, a soldier who had joined the rest voluntarily, lifted his bound hands and pointed upward, asking, Why are you so sad? This is nothing to the joys you have taught us to look forward to. No doubt your God will rescue you, the king's chief counsellor said sarcastically to Matthias. Yes, Matthias answered, but you will not see how he does it, because he will take my soul and leave you only my body. In a rage, the counsellor ordered him to be cut up there and then. In fact, as the trek proceeded, the counselor became so furious with Andrew that he vowed he would not eat until Andrew was dead. As the executioners hesitated, Andrew said, Don't keep your counselor hungry. Kill me. On June 3rd, seven days after the caravan reached Namagongo, Mbaga was killed by his father's order 
he was the son of the chief executioner, and the rest were wrapped in reed mats and placed on a pyre to be burned alive. In all, in all, 13 Catholics and 11 Protestants died, calling on the name of Jesus and declaring, you can burn our bodies, but you cannot harm our souls. Not long afterward, the king expelled the White Fathers from Uganda. However, the lay Christians carried on, translating the catechism into their own language and giving instruction in the faith secretly. When the White Fathers returned after King Mwanga's death, they found 500 Christians and 1,000 catechumens waiting for them. The Ugandan martyrs were beatified in 1920 by Pope Benedict XV and canonized in 1964 by Pope Paul VI. Their feast day is June the 3rd, the day on which most of them died. Now, um, beatification and canonization we haven't talked about in detail, but if you're interested, you can have a look at Appendix 1 to this talk, which describes what the church means by it. Many Christians have preferred martyrdom to apostasy, in which faith itself is lost. However, we deny Christ by any mortal sin. Accordingly, Dominic Savio took the motto, death rather than sin. It aptly describes Maria Goretti's choice. Now again, we know quite a bit about Maria Goretti. Um, most of it, most of what we're going to say, it comes principally from the testimony given by her murderer, Alessandro Serenelli, toward her beatification. Maria was born October 16, 1890, on a small farm at Corinaldo, near Ancona, Italy. The third of seven children, she was, in the words of her mother Assunta, happy, good, open-hearted, without whim, but with a sense and seriousness beyond her years, and never disobedient. In 1896, so when Maria was six, the family moved to Ferriere di Conca, where her father formed a partnership with the Serenelli family. Three years later, he died of malaria, and the family moved on to the Serenelli farm in order to survive. Maria did housework and looked after the younger children, while her mother worked on the farm. Before long, 19-year-old Alessandro Serenelli, the son, began making advances to Maria. She repulsed him, but said nothing about it because he threatened to kill her and her mother if she did. Finally, when she was 12, Alessandro attacked her outright. She resisted him, crying out, No, it is a sin. God does not want it. You will go to hell. Furious, Alessandro stabbed her 14 times. Several blows passed right through her body. It always impresses me that... She was concerned for his welfare, not for herself. Right. Maria was rushed to the hospital at Netuno, but nothing could save her life. The next morning she was given Holy Communion, but first she said clearly that she forgave Alessandro, that she would pray for his repentance, and that she wanted to see him in heaven. She died on July 6, 1902. Um, just looking at footnote 32, Maria had received her first communion in 1901. However, at this time in the church's history, in spite of the church's teaching, daily communion had become uncommon for fear that it would be received unworthily or merely out of habit. Between 1905 and 1907, Pope St. Pius X issued 10 documents advising everyone to receive communion frequently, even if possible daily. In 1910, he issued a decree restoring the ancient practice of having children receive their first communion as soon as they reach the age of discretion, which, of course, comes to some of us earlier and later or later than others. So she had received her first communion, but the morning after the attack, she was given Holy Communion. After eight years in prison, Alessandro repented. 
Released for good behavior after 27 years, he begged forgiveness of Maria's mother and became a Capuchin lay brother. He gave evidence at the church's inquiry into Maria's life and along with Maria's mother, brothers, sisters, and some 250,000 other people saw Pope Pius XII beatify her in 1947 and canonize her July 25th, 1950. Her feast day then is July 6th, the day she died. Alessandro died in 1970 at age 87, leaving the following letter written in 1961. I am now almost 80 years old. I am close to the end of my days. Looking back at my past, I recognize that in my early youth, I followed a false road, an evil path that led to my ruin. Through the content of printed magazines, immoral shows, and bad examples in the media, I saw the majority of the young people of my day following evil without even thinking twice. Unworried, I did the same thing. There were faithful and practicing Christian believers around me, but I paid no attention to them. I was blinded by a brute impulse that pushed me down the wrong way of living. At the age of 20, I committed a crime of passion, the memory of which still horrifies me today. Maria Goretti, now a saint, was my good angel whom God placed in my path to save me. Her words, both of rebuke and forgiveness, are still imprinted in my heart. She prayed for me, interceding for her killer. Thirty years in prison followed. If I had not been a minor in Italian law, I would have been sentenced to life in prison. Nevertheless, I accepted the sentence I received as something I deserved. Resigned, I atoned for my sin. Little Maria was truly my light, my protectress. With her help, I served those 27 years in prison well. When society accepted me back among its members, I tried to live honestly. With angelic charity, the sons of St. Francis, the minor Capuchins of the Marches, welcomed me among them, not as a servant, but as a brother. I have lived with them for 24 years. Now I look serenely to the time in which I will be admitted to the vision of God, to embrace my dear ones once again, and to be close to my guardian angel, Maria Goretti, and her dear mother, Assunta. May all who read this letter of mine desire to follow the blessed teaching of avoiding evil and following the good. May all who believe with the faith of little children that religion with its precepts is not something one can do without. Rather, it is true comfort and the only sure way in all of life's circumstances, even in the most painful. It's a beautiful letter. It's a beautiful letter. The, and from what you tell me and what another, <clears throat> what another priest has mentioned, pornography so available now on the internet is, it was his downfall. Yeah, so much, so much, um, such a proliferation compared to in his day, yeah. a little over a century and a half ago almost now. But it, it, one almost wishes that one would see Asunta uh, canonized yeah. for her forgiveness yeah. of her daughter's murderer. She died in 1902, by the way, so it's a century and a quarter, maybe? Yes. Yeah, yes. even less than what you said. So relatively recently. Then Thomas More. Thomas More, whose life is accurately portrayed in Robert Bolt's play and the film, A Man for All Seasons, tried his best to avoid martyrdom. Now, that play is based on the account or the biography of Thomas More written by his own son-in-law at the time. So again, this pretty reliable history. Trained as a lawyer... Sir Thomas More became Lord Chancellor of England under King Henry VIII in 1529. When Henry declared himself head of the church in England and Parliament supported him, More resigned. In the play, his daughter Meg tells him that the king is going to administer an oath. It's about the marriage, sir, says his son-in-law, Will Roper. 
referring to the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn after his divorce from Queen Catherine. What is the wording? Moore asks. We don't need to know the wording, says Roper. We know what it will mean. It will mean what the words say, Moore replies. An oath is made of words. It may be possible to take it or avoid it. Have we a copy of the bill? Then, seeing Roper still truculent, he explains, Now listen, Will. God made the angels to show him splendor, as he made animals for innocence and plants for their simplicity. If he suffers us to fall to such a case that there is no escaping, then we may stand to our tackle as best we can, and yes, Will, then we may clamor like champions if we have the spittle for it. But it's God's part, not our own to bring ourselves to that extremity. Our natural business lies in escaping. So let's go home and study this bill. So you see different saints. Some, John Braeburf swore an oath that he would not try and avoid martyrdom, even though, you know, even if he could get away. Thomas More did his best to avoid it. It's God's part to bring us to that. Moore found that he could not take the oath. He was arrested, imprisoned in the Tower of London, tried and condemned to death. Visiting her father in prison, Meg said passionately, but in reason, haven't you done as much as God can reasonably want? And Moore replies, well, finally, it isn't a matter of reason. Finally, it's a matter of love. Moore was beheaded July 6, 1535, declaring that he was dying the king's good servant, but God's first. He was beatified by Pope Leo XIII in 1886 and canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1935. His feast day is June 22nd. You might wonder why, when he was beheaded July 6th, but on June 22nd of that same year, St. John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester in England, had been beheaded by King Henry VIII for the same reason as Moore. So the feast day is St. John and Thomas. And in England, there are a number of churches named after the two of them. So as Moore said, finally, it's a matter of love. Whoever loves father or mother, son or daughter, more than me, is not worthy of me, Christ said. Do not suppose that my mission on earth is to spread peace. My mission is to spread not peace, but division. Not division for its own sake, but because the truth does bring division between those who accept it and those who don't. They will hail you into court. They will flog you in their synagogues. You will be brought to trial before rulers and kings to give witness before them and before the Gentiles on my account. You will be hated by all on account of me. It's good that we have that warning. <laughs> yeah. However, the martyrs have always argued like Christ. What profit does a man show who gains the whole world and destroys himself in the process? This is how Susanna reasoned in the book of Daniel. This year we heard that long gospel. Monday of the third, of fifth week of, of Lent. Fifth week, yeah. This is how Susanna answered. When the judges threatened to testify falsely against her if she did not give in to their lust, she replied, I am completely trapped. If I yield, it will be my death. If I refuse, I cannot escape your power. Yet it is better for me to fall into your power without guilt than to sin before the Lord. This is how Thomas More reasoned at his trial. In the play, as Sir Richard Rich leaves the witness stand after his perjury, More says, that's a chain of office you are wearing. May I see it? Reluctantly, because Rich has been a friend of More's and has now brought about his condemnation, through perjury, so reluctantly Rich stops and Moore examines the medallion. The red dragon, he says. What's this? Told that Rich has been appointed Attorney General for Wales, 
he says with pain and amusement, for whales? Why, Richard, it profits a man nothing to give his soul for the whole world, but for whales. <laughs> a sense of humor. In canonizing martyrs, the church confirms the truth of their judgment, according to which the love of God entails the obligation to respect his commandments, even in the most dire of circumstances, and the refusal to betray those commandments, even for the sake of saving one's own life. Let's stop at that point and take a break. Mm. Martyrdom, then, is the supreme witness to Christ, but relatively few people are called to it. As Thomas More said, it is God's part, not ours, to bring us to that extremity. However, we are all called to give daily witness, sometimes with heroic commitment, even at the cost of suffering and grave sacrifice. I know a very attractive black woman from Africa, She's tall and she dresses beautifully in the fashion of her country. People notice her. Because she is black in a largely white community, she is always bearing witness for the black people. If I do anything wrong, she said to me once, people blame the whole of Africa. <laughs> but there's truth in that. Yeah. It's awful. It's not fair, but it's true. When we were baptized, we became a new creation. And it shows, or it should show, in our dress, our conversation, our work, our recreation, etc. If we are known to be Catholics in a non-Catholic society, we are always bearing witness for Christ, whether we like it or not. If we do anything wrong, people blame the whole Catholic Church. It may not be fair, but it's true. For example, I know a woman who realized that if she turned left off Como Lake Road in Coquitlam onto All Saints Church property across a double yellow line, anyone seeing her would blame the church. So she started going another way. There are three enemies we must fight against all the days of our life. The world, in the bad sense, the flesh and the devil. However, it is our fight against the world that makes us stand out, for the world is everybody. In the face of the world, bearing witness to our faith requires the courage to be different. Here I just have to acknowledge the good job my parents did in our family. Not trying to make us be different for the sake of being different, but reassuring us that this is what would happen if we lived like Catholics. For example, being a Catholic can mean missing a game or turning down a job in order to go to Mass on Sunday. Crossing a picket line when the strike is illegal or immoral. Withdrawing from the inner ring if the group starts bullying. Being fired because we refuse to sign a false document dressing unfashionably in order to be modest, excusing ourselves from a get-together involving a dirty or anti-Christian movie, losing a boyfriend or girlfriend rather than commit fornication, sitting idle or praying silent, silently in a waiting room instead of reading gossip magazines. When the world cries, everybody does it, we have to answer courteously but firmly, no, I don't, I'm a Catholic. We must not be self-righteous, holier-than-thou prigs. Whatever we do, we must do out of love, whether we remain silent, speak, correct, or forgive. That's from St. Augustine. If anyone asks us the reason for our behavior, we must be ready to reply, but speak gently and respectfully, St. Peter said, not presuming to judge anyone else's conscience, 
and always more aware of the plank in our own eye than the speck in our neighbor. I think it might be, you know, people say you mustn't be judgmental. We have to be judgmental with respect to objective right and wrong. Where we must avoid judgment is, am I right, Father, in Condem condemning or approving anybody else's conscience oh, the subject before God. Of guilt, yes. Right. Daily witness to the faith <clears throat> means prudently avoiding even the appearance of wrongdoing. For example, an unmarried couple may live together chastely, but they tempt others to judge rashly or justify their own immorality. The way we dress sends a strong message about who we are. For example, I taught all my life in a public school, and I would dress up as a nun for Halloween. I would always be amazed at the way it drew people's attention to Christ. I remember one man, now dead, as I walked through the halls dressed like that, he said, Dominus Fobiscum, which in Latin, the Lord be with you, which we used, the priest used to say at Mass. And I replied, et cum spiritu tuo. I hadn't known before that that he was Catholic. And I know, Father, you've got countless examples. Your clericals have the same effect. Yes. I've even had, you know, been walking through a, par a parking lot and heard people cussing and swearing, looking up, seeing me, and saying, oh, sorry, Father. Just the, my wearing of a collar yeah. reminded them that they shouldn't have been talking the way they were. Yeah. And I think you said uh, it even encourages people to obey the law, crossing. Yeah, I've, I've seen it when I've been standing at, at a crosswalk waiting for the light to change. People started to walk across from the opposite side, looking up, seeing me, and stepping back almost as if I was a cop ready to <laughs> give them a ticket. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it does draw their attention, doesn't it? But it also stops me doing things such as jaywalking. Because, let's face it, I'm just as tempted to everybody else is doing it. But yeah. it's, it's wrong and don't, just don't do it. Right. For lay people, daily witness to Christ means dressing modestly, even if modesty is out of fashion. Modest dress is hard to define, for it varies with time and place. But we, always, we all recognize dress that is designed to be sexy, that is, to call attention to parts of the body that normally arouse sexual desire. I once, in, in school, I once heard one girl, I taught in high school, so these were 16, 17, 18 year olds, I once heard one girl tell another as part of a story, of course the guys were all still after her because of the way she was dressed, that's all I heard. Sometime later, when a student taking photography showed me a photo he had taken of a girl dressed and posed like a model, you can imagine it, I showed it to this same girl. I said, what does that picture say to you? She looked for a moment, grinned and said candidly, come and get me. Mm. Immodest dress tempts us and others to sin in thought, if not in word or deed. Many in our society have lost our inborn sense of modesty. Often it was killed by our mothers when we were small. As a result, we may have to ask others whether or not our dress is sexy. At Madonna House in Combermere, Ontario, a community of lay people living gospel-type lives, the young women once asked the young men that question. What do you find sexy? They found the answers, they said, to be eye-openers. I once lay in the nurse's office at school trying to stop my nose bleeding before class started and reading a poster on the wall. Don't feel guilty if you've been raped, it said. You have the right to go where you want, when you want, dressed as you want, on your own, with, with whomever you want, without being attacked. True. We also have the right to leave whatever valuables we want in unlocked cars, 
parked wherever and whenever we want for as long as we want. But we're awfully stupid but to do it. both of these rights remind me of an old jingle. Here li- this is something my, fa- my husband used to quote. Here lies the body of Jonathan J., who died maintaining his right of way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along. But he's just as dead as if he'd been wrong. I sometimes think that um, because people walk along looking at their phones so much now, many people step off the curb, you know, in a, in a proper crosswalk, without looking to see if there are any cars coming. That is their right. But as Father says, it's not very wise. There could be a car coming, a, could, a car who doesn't know that you have the right of way. Suppose you are waiting to turn left. An approaching car slows down and flashes its headlights, so you start to turn. But the car keeps going and runs into you. The problem is that flashing headlights can mean over a dozen different things. You might like to read some of the things it can mean in various parts of the world in footnote 63. And you're not always sure what it indicates, what no. it signifies. It may Even, mean coming through. Yeah. Watch out. Yeah. <laughs> the way you understood the signal may not be the way the other driver meant it. Sexual signals, including dress, can be similarly misunderstood. The solution is to learn the language, not just what we mean by it but also what others understand by it and then help it to help every and then use it to help everyone remain chaste yeah. i'm just looking at footnote 65 mothers including my mother used to teach their children the language of dress and behavior for example little girls were taught to sit with their legs together and not to lie on the floor little children were told to shut the bathroom door and to approach a woman, not a man, if they were lost. I don't think this is being taught nowadays. We'll come back to that in one of the appendices. So our dress is important. Then our conversation. We bear witness to Christ in our conversation, not only by avoiding sins like lies, detraction, etc., but also in positive ways. For example, when I went back to work on Easter Tuesday after the four-day weekend, everyone, again, this is a public school, everyone would ask casually, how was your weekend? Did you do anything special? Yes. When Father had a parish, I assisted at baptisms, confirmations, and receptions into the church. Of course I would mention it. It would have been hard for me to hide it. Why not mention the Easter vigil? It was something Something special. special. More important than going skiing. (laughs) But we don't have to talk about church-type things. We can state what we think when someone tries to force a conversational card on us. That is, when someone talks as though, of course, we, like them, approve of something evil, or disapprove of something good, or find virtue amusing, or condone crime and violence. Or just the way they're constantly putting down of politicians, as if, you know... It's, it's not right. No. We owe them respect. But it can be done in a way that makes it difficult for you to disagree. Yeah. Well, of course, we all know what so-and-so is like. Yeah. <laughs> and you're yeah. supposed to go along with it. And you have to yeah. say, no, I don't. Yeah. Not everybody likes to talk to strangers, but I do. And I often ask them where their accents come from. They usually seem ready and even eager to tell me. Italy, a young woman replied once. I've been here three months. Oh, so you're probably Catholic, I said. Yes, so am I. Do you know that three parishes in our diocese have mass in Italian? I don't know how many it is now, but it was three then. I looked up the schedules when I got home, made a copy, and gave it to her the next time I saw her. Often people say they used to be Catholic. Then I tell them about this course. If they say they are Catholic, I say, great, which parish are you in? Often they'll say, oh, I don't go to Mass. Then I tell them about this course. I've, I've even picked up hitchhikers who said that they used to be Catholic. Before they got out of the car, they made a good confession. How wonderful. And promised to 
start practicing their faith. Yeah. Yeah. Who's somebody just recently? Oh, I know who it is, but she asked me not to say anything, so I can't. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if people know we are Catholic, they will talk to us and ask us about our faith. It used to happen to me a lot because I was a physics teacher. Oh, you're Catholic? How do you reconcile that with teaching science? You know, it's... Yeah. And we should be ever ready to reply, but speak gently and respectfully. I was speaking of um, gently and respectfully. Um, there's a group of um, young people f who belong to this uh, 40 Days for Life who were praying outside the John Paul II Center when we taught there last Sunday. And I was thinking of um, Abby Johnson, who wrote the book Abby, uh, Unplanned, if you remember. Um, she was a convinced abortionist, is the quickest way to put it. She ran an abortion clinic. When she changed her mind on the subject, it was those people she went to, the 40 Days for Life, not the more militant groups who are also fighting for life, but those who had always spoken to her gently and respectfully. And courteously. Courteously. Yes. Just, just praying. Praying and saying good morning when she walked past. Yeah. They knew who she was, she knew who they were. Yeah. Yeah. Then in our work, the world, in the bad sense, defines work as what we do to make money. And it's hard to break that habit of thought. Accordingly, Father and I have to state right now that work, in what follows, includes the work of a mother, a homemaker, or a volunteer, none of which is paid. We work because God created us in his image. My father is at work until now, and I am at work as well, Jesus said. In the parable of the silver pieces, he commanded us to work with the talents God has given us. Through our work, we fulfill our potential in part by helping to bring creation to the perfection God planned for it. Work is for man, not man for work. We can bear witness to our faith first by choosing work that is worth doing, even if it does not pay well. For example, we have, um, I think he admits it, I'm not sure. Anyway, I know a priest who had an extremely well-paid John with Amazon, but who gave it up to do the better work of a Catholic priest, even though it doesn't pay nearly as much. <laughs> so that's the first thing, by choosing work that's worth doing, even if it does not pay well. And second, doing our work well even if we are not paid extra. Work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do, said Dorothy Sayers. That's how we think about our hobbies, right? I live to do that, not I do it to live. Think about the enthusiasm you have for your own hobbies. Work is, or it should be, the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction, and the medium in which he offers himself to God. We should think of our work as we think of our hobbies, our leisure interests, and the things we make and do for pleasure. If we think like this, we will ask not whether an enterprise will pay, but how good it is. Not what a person earns, but what his work is worth. Not whether products will sell, but whether they are useful and well made. Not how much a job pays, but whether the work exercises our faculties properly. This is the way I think you know who I mean, the man who's made um, most of my furniture. He talks like this about his yeah. work. Real enthusiasm. Yeah. Yeah. In one kind of job, we can truly say, I am doing work that is worth doing. It would still be worth doing if nobody paid for it. But as I need to be fed and housed and clothed, 
I must be paid while I do it. In the other kind of job, people do work whose sole purpose is the earning of money. Work which need not be, ought not to be, or would not be done by anyone in the whole world unless it were paid. If we you had... see a lot of the work done in the hospitals by volunteers, just over and above the call of duty, not being paid, but just love of God and love of neighbor. Mm -hmm. If we have any choice, we shall be after the same jobs like greyhounds and stick there like limpets. We shall try to earn our living by doing well what would be worth doing even if we did not need the pay. We will have to restrain our avarice for the insane jobs usually pay the most and demand the least. I was talking recently to two or three different lawyers on different situations and pointing out that how often they're criticized for their work, but nevertheless pointing out how much pro bono work yes. so many lawyers do. Yeah. Then in our recreation, we bear witness to our faith in our recreation by avoiding excess, which endangers anyone's health or safety in food, alcohol, tobacco, speed, sports, expense, etc. I'm thinking here, I won't mention the name, but I think you know who I mean, Father, a very rich man who stopped going to a certain restaurant because he felt they were charging too much. <laughs> and everybody laughed, knowing that he could afford it, but he thinks it's wrong to overcharge. overcharge. We also bear witness to our faith by rejecting the neo-pagan cult of the body, which idolizes physical perfection and success in sports, idolizes, and favors the strong over the weak. By refusing entertainment that is immodest, impure, or degrading to humans. And by putting our religious duties before recreation. I couldn't go to Mass on Sunday. I had sports. Yeah. We bear witness to our faith not only by rejecting evil, but also by refusing to cooperate with it. For example, to order, advise, facilitate, approve, or praise it. However, we're all sinners. We can argue, therefore, that we cooperate with evil when we eat in a restaurant whose owner is unfair to his employees, or rent a house to a common law or cohabiting couple. In fact, we can be said to cooperate with evil just by coexisting with others in a sinful world. Sins give rise to social situations and institutions that are contrary to the divine goodness. These structures of sin make us accomplices in evil. At what point must we refuse to cooperate with evil? Before we try and answer that, consider these examples. First, when the BC Teachers Federation became a union, some teachers refused to join, thereby risking their jobs, because the BCTF supports abortion, which it does actively. However, other anti-abortion teachers did join, arguing that no one would suppose they were pro-abortion just because they were members, and that their dismissal would leave the public schools with no teachers except pro-abortionists. Who is right? Second, in 1982, United Way granted membership to Planned Parenthood, which is pro-abortion. Accordingly, Archbishop James Carney of Vancouver announced that Vancouver's Catholic Charities and Catholic Community Services would no longer would, would accept no more funding from United Way as of January the 1st, 1983. What would you have done? And I, I understand that the Archdiocese used to receive a substantial... It was a substantial amount, yes. Yeah. Third, in Fiddler on the Roof, Tevia, a Jew, 
gives in when his first daughter wants to choose her own husband, and again when his second daughter wants to marry without his permission. But when his third daughter wants to marry a Christian, he refuses, saying, if I bend, if I try to bend that far, I'll break. What would you do? Fourth, in Ukraine, the Soviet Union outlawed the Catholic Church, but not the Orthodox Church. When the Soviet Union broke up, many Orthodox priests became Catholics. Presumably, they had stayed in the Orthodox Church so that the people would have access to the sacraments. The Orthodox Church has valid sacraments. What would you have done? Fifth, from 1957 on, China had a government-approved Catholic Church, which rejected ties to the Vatican and ordained and appointed bishops without Vatican approval. She also had an underground Catholic Church, which was loyal to the Pope, but persecuted. Which would you have joined? I'm just looking at footnote 94. With the Provisional Accord on the Nomination of Bishops signed by China and the Vatican, September 22, 2018, and now in effect until, I don't think we updated this last year, anyway, and in effect certainly till October 22, 2022, all government-appointed bishops have reconciled with the Vatican, and five have been ordained with joint approval. That needs to be updated. I don't know what the situation is right now. Do you, I Father? don't know. That's almost a year and a half ago. Yeah, but the... the the question is put just to show you the difficulty. Yes. In 1988, Father Vince, then editor of the BC Catholic, spent time blocking access to an abortion clinic. He was arrested, tried, and sentenced to time in prison. You didn't know he was an ex-con, did you? Did he do the right thing? Many of our relatives are living in conjugal intimacy with people they're not married to. How should we treat them? One, one of my sisters invited me to the baptism of her daughter as an Anglican. Another sister was invited to the wedding of a man who had told her he was divorced. Two Catholics I know have been invited to homosexual so-called weddings. Should we accept? Many people practice yoga for physical exercise. However, its specific benefits are often said to be based on the non-Christian philosophy of its Eastern roots. And we, yes, we talked about that in our Appendix 7 to the talk on the first three commandments. To what extent should we practice yoga? An area where there is great difficulty Sometimes you get parents whose children have moved in with each other and then they want to go into a, a marriage in a, a non-Catholic union of some sort or another and they invite their parents. One may say, if that's their relationship, I'm not even going to let them do my, um, darken our door. The other may say, no, in charity we need to, which is right. It's both, in a sense, are right. Both are trying to yep. do what they can. Somewhere we must draw a line in our cooperation with evil. But it's hard to see where. And when we have drawn our own line, we must not criticize or condemn others for drawing theirs somewhere else. Now, this next bit reminds me of Fiddler on the Roof. When, when Tevia is wondering whether to let his daughters marry in the way they want, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the other hand. <laughs> on the one hand, we must care about our neighbor's true good and authentic freedom, which we will not foster by um, concealing or weakening moral truth. On the other hand, we must never separate our clear and forceful presentation of moral truth from a profound and heartfelt respect for the person. On the one hand, charity towards souls demands that we omit nothing from the saving doctrine of Christ. On the other hand, we must present this doctrine with tolerance and charity. 
you can think of so many applications of, and all of that is from, what is it from, 96 on, Pope John Paul, Veritatis Splendor, and Pope Paul VI, Humani Vitae. Tell the truth, but as St. Peter said, with respect and charity. Jesus, who came not to judge the world, but to save it, was uncompromisingly stern towards sin, but patient and rich in mercy towards sinners. Where do we draw the line? Uncompromisingly stern towards sin but patient and rich in mercy toward sinners. Where do we draw the line? Paul, St. Paul, gives some helpful advice. Speaking about eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols, that is, false gods, he says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. And if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you are disposed to go, Eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. This means, for example, that if we are invited to a wedding, we do not have to investigate whether the couple are free to marry, what they mean by their vows, etc. On the other hand, St. Paul says, if someone tells you that the meat you are eating comes from an animal sacrificed to an idol, then, out of consideration for the other person, you have an obligation to show your disapproval, to set a good example and avoid giving scandal. That's so helpful. I think so. Yeah. This means that if one of the wedding couple tells you that he's already married and divorced, you might have to decline the wedding invitation so as not to condone an ambiguity about the nature of marriage. None of these are easy Easy questions to, describe, to to answer. Each situation is unique in a sense. Yeah, and and even 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 if it weren't, the people trying to make the decisions are unique. Yes. <laughs> Positive signs of our witness to Christ. We can bear witness to Christ positively by displaying statues, crucifixes, and saints' pictures in our homes offices, cars, etc. Wearing crucifixes, scapulas, or medals of Mary and other saints. Making the sign of the cross when we pass a Catholic church. That's one I try to do always, and I think you do too, Father. Mm -hmm. Saying a prayer when we start driving. Saying a prayer when we hear a siren. Saying grace before and after meals, even in public. Being friendly, and that includes making the sign of the cross. We should be proud of the cross. Not in a bad sense, but in a good sense. Thanking God that he's chosen us to recognize the cross. And being friendly to everyone, but, as St. Paul says, especially those of the household of the faith. And by objecting gently in charity to the misuse of God's name. This is, <laughs> it's an amusing story, but um, I once had a very good um, physics student in grade 11 who had just come from China, so his English was not that good, but he did so well on his first test. I don't think he made a single mistake, and there was a very difficult problem on it, um, but when I handed it back to him, I it told the whole class that he had not made a single mistake. And so the whole class was quiet to hear his reaction. So when he took it from me, he said, Jesus Christ. So I said, oh, please don't say that. I'm a Christian. He said, why? What does it mean? <laughs> Apparently he'd heard the other students using it. So I explained very briefly, this was a public school, who Jesus Christ was and uh, why I didn't like that use of his name. And then he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you, Mrs. Crimmins. What should I have said? Oh, my God. And the whole class broke up because they knew I would object to that. I said, no. Okay, what would you have said? I said, I think I would have said, wow, <laughs> which doesn't really mean anything. The founder of Alpha, 
said once that somebody had come up to him, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Said, came up to him and said, how many people do you c- come to your service? And he told them, it was several hundred or whatever it was, and the person said, Jesus Christ. He responded, yes, he's there too. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, he, yeah. in other words, correcting the person, but, gently. but leading them forward. Yes. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Yeah. So, to sum up, We bear witness to Christ best, not by preaching, but by the way we live. For example, no extramarital sex, lifelong marriage, no artificial contraception, accepting children lovingly from God, as we promise in the Catholic marriage service, mass every Sunday, regular confession, no meat on Fridays, Modesty in dress, identifying dress for a priest or a nun. No dirty talk, movies, jokes, magazines, or internet images. Honesty in business. No illegal strikes. Reporting all our income. Always telling the truth. No calumny, detraction, or backbiting. No speeding, jaywalking, illegal parking, etc. No appearance of approving evil by silence or by speech. Pope Benedict said we must reacquire the consciousness of belonging to a minority that is opposed to the spirit of the world. We must find again the courage of nonconformism, the capacity to oppose many of the trends of the surrounding culture. If we are indistinguishable from the rest of today's society, we are not following Christ. He stood out. Now, we've got two, no, three appendices. The first one is the beatification and canonization of saints. Um, um, which you just might be interested in. Appendix two, the importance of clerical dress. First in a letter from Archbishop Exner, the late Archbishop Exner, OMI of Vancouver, and then in a letter from the Vatican. Important that priests, and in a sense, it's a very easy way of bearing witness, isn't it, Father? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if it's easy. It's easy to do. It, it does involve you, I'm sure, in a lot of um, extra work. <laughs> well, as I say, it stops you doing something like jaywalking or uh, sampling grapes as you walk through a, through a supermarket, any of things like that. that yeah. just you, You'd be letting Christ down, yeah. letting the church down. And then Appendix 3, Modest Dress. Um, finally, after, <laughs> after beseeching a number of um, men to tell us, we finally got this letter, the, part, the, the top of page 598, written to women from a married man. I'm just looking at the third paragraph. I believe that many women are unaware of how certain forms of their dress affect men. So let me be specific. I speak as a normal married man who has striven for sexual purity for 20 years and enjoyed a happy marriage for 16. It's worth reading. And I think as he does, there are women I see at church, presumably good, convinced Catholics, dressing, immodestly. Worth reading. And then the second part, which comes partly from me and partly from partly from a website, and I've forgotten the name of it. The dilemma we have as, as women who want to live good Catholic lives, we want men to appreciate us as persons, not just sex objects, but we also want them to notice our sexual attraction insofar as it's part of God's design. 
frequent excessive display of our sexual parts frustrates both. It not only makes us look like sex objects, but also helps build immunity to our sexual attraction. I remember when women first started, I was still teaching, so it's maybe 15, 20 years ago, started wearing plunging necklines as part of everyday dress. I had a couple who were going out together in my Math 11 class, and she was wearing, she was dressed like that. He was helping her with her math. And I watched him, and I didn't see him once look. He was looking at his calculator, looking at the questions, and I thought, how does a 16-year-old boy avoid that temptation? And I thought, I think it can only be, he's got so used to it, it doesn't affect him anymore. Is that what we want as women? Surely not. So a number of, um, a number of suggestions that I think perhaps women don't think about, that is women who want to be modest, um, that I got from a website, um, it, I think it's worth reading. Do I dress like this? Am I aware of how men and I'm speaking as a woman, but I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure the, the converse is, 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 is true at all. True as well, I should say. Anyway, worth reading, I think. The next reading, we've gone through half the first, uh, first half, I should say, of St. Luke's Gospel. So we've read Matthew, Mark, first half of Luke. Now we're finishing the second half of Luke's Gospel, chapter 11 to 24. And as you read through that this week, you will read how Christ's instruction uh, was on how to love our neighbor. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Love of God and love of neighbor, then, is the topic for next week's talk. In the meantime... May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. <laughs>